Podcast. I'm your host, Andrea Renee, joined by my lovely, as ever, co-hosts and mavens of the video game world, Miss Alexa Ray Korea. What up? Christine Steimer. Hi. And back from rocking her socks off, Brittany Brombacher. Hello. That was my Metallica voice. Ah, okay. I was like, that's scary. Can you hear Uh, me? Can I what? How's your hearing? Oh, actually, my <laughs> ears. <I was> like, <laughs> that's funny. Uh, my ears didn't ring. Actually, I was really impressed. I don't know if it's my old age or if I'm just getting more resilient. You're You've just age. lost the hearing already. You so yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I'm glad that you had a good time. But we are gladder. Is that a word? Yeah. No. Uh, no. Now. Back. Yeah. Um, because we got lots of um, video games and stuff to talk about this week. So before we do that, I just want to give a big shout out and thank you to all of our fans around the globe who are listening to the What's Good Game podcast or watching the video on YouTube at youtube.com slash what's good games. Britt, we have exciting news. We're on a new platform. We <gasps> are. We are on Spotify. Spotify oh, was... Ah, they were rad enough to accept us. It was a grueling application process. Not really. We just had to submit some numbers. And they were like, of course, you can come on. So please check us out on Spotify. We were on some of the featured podcasts. So that was exciting, too. Oh, that's that's wonderful. Yeah. So if you guys were looking for another platform (laughs) to rate and subscribe and download our podcast on, uh, that is another one you can do that. So uh, thanks so much, Britt, for getting that together. Um, We have... A cool thing coming up at the end of the month. PAX West, the Penny Arcade Expo, is happening in Seattle. Oh God, it is so soon. <laughs> coming so quickly. Uh, that's what she, she said. said. Oh, God, sorry. Um, Hold up the pillow. We have a panel, you guys. What's Good Games Live? If you are going to be in Seattle at PAX, please come visit us at Saturday, September 2nd at 5 p.m. is when our panel will be. We're doing a a fun activation with our friends over at Take This. We will also be volunteering at the AFK room on Sunday. So you can come visit us there as well. And uh, we'll have more announcements about what the rest of us are doing because it's not just What's Good Games. I'm doing some stuff. Alexa's doing some stuff. These girls are doing some stuff. We'll have more announcements um, coming very soon. So please keep an eye on our social media account. That's uh, What's Good underscore Games on Twitter. And of course, What's Good Games games.com where you can find all of our announcements so speaking of topical stuff it's time for some news news time we should get like a news jingle or something yeah yeah we really should yeah no it's just our that's theme just our song. song i was just gonna let her keep going <laughs> i know me too <laughs> okay so the first story uh battle.net is undead so this is an interesting one. Um, so this announcement came from Blizzard. They said, when we announced that we'd be transitioning away from Battle.net, the name for our online gaming service, we suspected that the shift would be challenging. We understood that Battle.net stood for something special. It represents years of shared history and enjoyment, community, and friendship for all of us and our players. Battle.net is the central nervous system for Blizzard, games, and the connective tissue that has brought Blizzard players together since 1996. The technology was never going away, but after giving branding... After giving the branding change further consideration and also hearing your feedback, we're in agreement that the name should stay as well. Taken from the developer formerly known as Silicone and Synapse and Chaos Studios, names are important too. Moving forward to help offset some of the original concerns we listed back in September, we will be connecting Blizzard to Battle.net in our logo for the service and in general when we refer to it in print, you'll see it as Battle, or excuse me, you'll see it as Blizzard Battle.net. Not Blizzard's Battle.net? No, just Blizzard Battle.net. <laughs> Branding. So how do, you, really how do you ladies feel about this? Were you upset when you heard that Blizzard was changing the name of Battle.net? No. They're upset? No. <laughs> There's other things in life to worry about. <laughs> I mean, I agree with you, but the internet got mad about it. Well, what, that's what the internet does everything. best. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. I mean... But- It's been around since 96. I think it launched with Diablo at a time where, and Blizzard built this, if I recall correctly, because at that time, in 1996, there wasn't a very easy way to connect with other players online and communicate with them, chat with them. There were other programs, but I think with certain uh, games, they didn't work very well. So Blizzard made Battle.net. And so I think I have the quote here. Uh, In 2016, they said, over time, though, we've seen that there's been occasional confusion and inefficiencies related to having two separate identities under which everything falls, Blizzard and Battle.net. 
makes sense. But I think what happened, and let me know what you ladies think, someone up there in the corporate area is like, where's our branding and marketing? People see Battle.net. They don't know that's Blizzard necessarily. Anyway, that's my Nailed teaser. it. Yeah. No, I yeah, think you're right. Exactly I think what somebody happened. was like, wait a minute. How do people know that these things are connected? And you're like, well, most gamers just know because we've been here forever. Right. Um, but, yeah, I mean, they're probably correct in that somebody knew. And especially they're probably going to be bringing in a lot of new players with Destiny. Um, the PC build working with uh, Battle.net. Well, I'm still going to call it Battle.net. Fuck you. Yep. <laughs> but, like, <laughs> no, pretty much. <laughs> yep. And especially because, yeah. like, Blizzard yeah, Battle is just was, a, right? It's a yeah. silly name. Like, you took a name and you made it sillier, and I don't know why. <laughs> but also, I mean, I know like, why, but... It's, like, considering, like, if they have to... If they changed it, like the just the migration work that I would go into that and remembering, oh no, now I have to go to blizzard.net, not battle.net. Like that's just it's many, I'm many sure people it'll redirect. inconvenienced. I'm sure you can still type in battle.net, it'll just redirect you to Blizzard Battle. But then you won't. It just sounds like its own net. video game, doesn't it? Like Blizzard, Blizzard battle. battle. No, it sounds like it's still gonna be just battle.net, but like the name of it in print will be Blizzard Battle. Oh, correct. But right, why just okay. That's Blizzard fine. Ba- why not Blizzard's Battle.net? It okay. I am bothered by this thing. <laughs> don't. It does not. It does not sound. If you weren't bothered by it the first time, don't get no, bothered by it now. But like Blizzard, <laughs> Blizzard Battle sounds. Blizzard Battle sounds like a mode in Mario Kart. <laughs> Blizzard's Battle.net. Can, can is we like, make this oh, a thing? Okay, Nintendo. <laughs> oh, that is Battle.net, which is owned by Blizzard, home of many Blizzard games and properties that I would like to play. <laughs> So like <laughs> they can't stick the little like frustrious in there. No. 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 Um yeah. I mean, but they're re rebranding. Now they have the best of both worlds. <laughs> they have Blizzard and Battle.net. So all all those involved will be happy because they'll know it's Blizzard and they'll have the Battle.net. Battle.net. Good job. GG everyone. Yeah, like yeah. I don't I don't know. Okay. Cool. 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 Everything's fine. <laughs> it's fine. Next next story speaking of Blizzard, their their BFF Activision um has announced Call of Duty World War II private multiplayer beta. So, um this is interesting. Expect uh, according to the article I saw over on Polygon, they said say expect some of the usual fare for a multiplayer beta which includes three multiplayer maps and modes deathmatch, domination and hardpoint and those will all be playable. I can talk, sorry. Uh, I read that real, not eloquently. Uh, <laughs> players will get a peek at Call of Duty World War II's new war gameplay mode. So this was developed in partnership with Raven Software, who has worked on previous Call of Duty tiles, as a new way to play Call of Duty multiplayer in an immersive allied versus Axis fight across the war-torn village of St. Lo, France. So that's going to be interesting to see what that's all about private beta participants will also get a look at divisions which replaces the pick 10 create a class system originally created by Treyarch for call of duty black ops 2 and sledgehammer is streamlining the class creation system which will let players join the infantry expeditionary airborne armored or mountain division each of which have their own combat and weapon skills some of the features, including the new headquarters, social space, and in-game supply drops and loot, won't be available during the beta, but more details on what will be are available in Sledgehammer's post on their website if you guys are intrigued to learn more. So, it begins on August 25th on PS4. Xbox One owners who pre-order will get access to the beta on September 1st, and of course, the game itself will be releasing on November 3rd for PS4, Windows PC, and Xbox One. Who's ready to shoot some stuff? <laughs> Yay. I think you are, Andrea. I think you are the one. I, I appreciate what this means for the shooting fans of the world and for the Call of Duty fans. I'm excited to check out the campaign. I, I honestly could give no sh- I couldn't give a shit what's about the multiplayer, although I respect the importance it has. Andrea, I think you're the only one who's really excited about this. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm just interested to see them, you know, take a a different change of pace from the futuristic warfare that we've seen uh, in the last couple of titles. And I am really excited to see, you know, Sledgehammer back at the helm. I think that they've done a great job and uh, everything I've seen so far looks really great. Uh, People I talk about all the time how people love to hate Mm -hmm. Call of Duty, but they do a lot of stuff right. Um, And the the gameplay has always been fun. 
I really enjoy the single player campaigns. I think that they're really well crafted, you know, pieces of gameplay. And yeah, I'm going to I'm going to jump in and try some PVP, but I always get to just get crushed in Call of Duty. Did you guys catch any of the Call of Duty World League Championship over the weekend? Nope. Over the last weekend? So the finals happen, and this, I mean, I mean, this is extremely high-level play, like the highest level play, and it was really exciting uh, to watch. I kind of wish I had been there. Have you ladies ever attended an esports event? Yes. I went to Evo a couple years ago, and I sat through like three and a half hours of Smash Brothers, and it was the best, most exciting, thrilling, live-action anything I'd ever been to, event-wise. I, I think it was more exciting than a football game, and I've been to many football games in my life. I yeah. love it. No, I agree. Like, like esports is is big and getting bigger, you know, for a reason. So, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to to checking this out. Does the World War II setting do anything for you, ladies? Are you? Is it? Does it maybe go? Hey, I don't normally like Call of Duty, but because they're going back, you know, to this era, it's intriguing even a little bit. Or does it make you like it less? Um. So I talked about this a little bit at E3, actually, in the interview with the Call of Duty producer. Um, my brother, my littlest brother, is a very big Call of Duty fan. And the last game he played, I think, was Ghosts. And he's also a big history buff. So he abandoned it when the series went futuristic and said, I'll go back when it like goes back to history. Like, give me a World War II game and I'll play again. And hearing his excitement when they announced this and getting his text just being like oh holy crap they're going back like i'm gonna play like that's exciting for me to see other people that are that that are into that aspect of the game that are into that kind of like era it gets me excited to see them being excited especially like my siblings so i will i like what they've done with it i like what i've seen of how they've shaped the world and how they've built it for their purposes so i like britney i will probably give the campaign a try and play the campaign, but I don't like people, so you won't find me online. <laughs> <laughs> when, when was the last time we got a Call of Duty World War game? Like, that was, like, a, a long time a ago. A while ago. While, right, and so I think that's something I'm excited about to jump back into. Um, I played the, and I'm sorry, I don't know Call of Duty that well, and all of the games kind of mesh into one at some point. The last one that I played was the futuristic one in space. Infinite Warfare? Yes, and I really enjoyed it, but I'm more looking forward to revisiting uh, the World Wars now that, you know, the technology has advanced and it's going to be exciting to see what they can do with the storytelling. The okay. last Call of Duty campaign I finished, not started, but finished, I think was Modern Warfare 2. Like, I have not wow. played, I have not finished a Call of Duty campaign in the longest time. That was and 2009. That being, what was? Modern Warfare, Modern Warfare 2. 2. Yeah. Damn. Just, it's not a game that I particularly care about um i do think i agree with you like the campaigns can be fun but it's not something where i'm like itching to go get it to play the campaign it's just like if it happens to come across my way at some point i don't know i even had i have the game i have infinite warfare <laughs> you walking down I just, the street and yeah if i took a copy if, of if i'm Call walking Duty. down the street and a van <laughs> comes up beside me and pulls me in and sits me down and says you need to play this call of duty campaign right now that's the it. most terrifying scenario okay, of a well, van coming up yeah. next to you and pulling you inside. Why? I thought the van was going to pull up next to you and just like throw it at you and drive away. Yeah, first yeah. of all, if you get abducted by that a van, I hope you call someone before you do anything they tell you to do. Or, you know, I'm run. just playing a video game. I'm sure it's fine. <laughs> now I'm, I don't know. I'm worried Stranger about danger. you walking home alone now. Yeah, now I have these like <laughs> mental images this time. We're walking home and a wild Call of Duty World War II like jumps out of a bush and like attacks her. <laughs> <laughs> oh box. god please no <laughs> not the game it's anything but the game oh my gosh okay no yeah. let's hope no one gets abducted ever because that's bad yeah that's um, true <laughs> moving <Very> on <laughs> Mewtwo coming soon to Pokemon Go by appointment only whatever whatever appointment so, only whatever. slash uh, Oof, I, yeah, okay so bad. I say Niantic but other people say Niantic Niantic. How do you say it, Alexa Ray? Niantic. 
So I'm saying it correctly. Yes. Perfect. People say Nayan I love Tiffany being right. to learn English pronunciation words. Um, <laughs> they just wrapped up their special Pokemon Go event in Japan where trainers could battle and catch the legendary Pokemon Mewtwo for the first time. That means players worldwide will soon be able to get him, but they'll have to prove their dedication first. According to an article on Game Informer, a new tier of battles called Exclusive Raid Battles are rolling out to Pokemon Go in the coming weeks. These will be different from current raid battles in that you'll need an invite to participate in these timed events. To get invited, players will have to complete a traditional raid battle at a site where the Exclusive Raid Battle will be scheduled. Niantech says invites will also be include details on when the exclusive raid will be taking place so trainers can best plan their attacks and of course Mewtwo the first legendary Pokemon to appear in these new raids but you can expect to see other legendary types rotating in over time so this is weird it's mean weird is an understatement I I don't know so Britt as our resident Pokemon Go expert uh how do you feel about this news Okay, so what's frustrating about it is I understand you want to have, like, the community involved. You want multiplayer. You want everyone to get together and have the warm and fuzzy feelings. Oh, yeah, we're catching you too. Oh, my God, it's amazing. However, are you forgetting completely about your fans who live in rural areas? I hate that word, rural areas rural. that don't have gyms nearby who maybe only have a few hours a, a week to do some polka hunting who have a very hard time getting people together to do the raids as they currently are. So with this, how it works, and they, they haven't said how long, it, how long the expiration time is, you have to just hope that you come across and you defeat a raid monster that is so hap that's going to have Mewtwo there in the future. So does that make sense? So, there, yeah, so it's, it's like not RNG oh. on RNG. Exactly. And so that's the issue I'm having. I mean, I think the exclusive raid battle is okay, whatever. But if that didn't alienate people, like where I live and where my parents live, like we don't have a lot of gyms nearby. And so I have to get in my car and like drive to them. And it's just a pain in the ass. So I'm not, I'm not happy. Alexa and I were venting about this I, a little bit. I hate before. it. Um, but Brittany, as the, uh, as the resident poke huntress <laughs> here, um, I know Articuno came out a couple weeks back and it was a big deal for people um on a scale of one to like holy shit how important for you as a pokemon trainer in the game as someone who's played a lot of this game and invested a lot of time in it how important is it to you to get to get mewtwo like is this like a giant fucking deal or is this like another big inconvenience no, it's a really big deal. You know, I want to collect all of the Pokemons, especially the original, because um, that's like the nostalgia that I have with the series, and that's how I got involved like 20 years ago. <clears throat> and it's really annoying because even the raids as they are, I would find an Articuno raid or a Zapdos raid or a Moltres raid, and I'd be like, ah, oh, yay, but there's no one around me. And you, it's impossible to take down with just two, three people. Mm -hmm. And so you would just sit around for like 30 minutes and then try to convince people who come by, like, hey, how about you hang around with me? And then we'll have a shot at defeating this boss. And then we'll have a shot at catching it. And it's just not a very enticing system. And you'll have so. a 3% chance of actually getting it. Exactly. And so... I'm just, it's, I don't know what Niantic's doing. I, I mean, I understand. Like I said, I don't have a problem with the exclusive raid battles if it didn't alienate those who don't have right. the gyms nearby or the means to access them. That's my issue. I can't help but wonder if when Niantic was put, so I played Pokemon Go in its alpha many, many moons ago. I actually went to Niantic and did like a walking tour of Soma where they showed us how the game would work. And one of my questions for them was, okay, this works great in a city like San Francisco where there's a Pokestop every 50 feet and there's all these Pokemon running around and I'm near water and forests and highways and whatever. Um, but how is this going to work in rural areas? And they said that was something they were still figuring it out. Ye <laughs> and they haven't figured it out, apparently. No. Yeah, like, mucho time later, it seems to me like if they haven't figured it out by now, it almost feels to me like they are wholesale ignoring the issue of the players not near major cities. Like, this, it has to be... They're not, like... I don't think they're hand-dropping everything, but this has to be something in the code that they're just not going back in and poking at and looking to fix. Um, I think it's actually seeing the fervor around Pokemon Go in the past like couple, like you know year, going to that Poke Crawl with Andrea last year, hearing you talk about it and how much time and money you've spent on it, and friends of mine that have went and gotten all Pokemon and have planned outings based on Pokemon Go. I just feel like 
this is a giant, like, it's a giant fuck you to everyone. Like, considering how much people love this game, it is an absolute shock to me that Niantic isn't doing more to correct that issue and is still locking things like Mewtwo behind weird arbitrary gates, like being in a big area, maybe participating in a raid, and then maybe getting an invite to that raid. That just seems completely unfair, especially with trading Mm -hmm. still not on the table. So it's not like you can't send a friend out to you know, the middle of Seattle at the Space Needle or whatever to get Mewtwo and get it again and then come back to you and trade. Like, that's not even an option. So, what's... Yeah. What, wow. What's I, going on, Niantic? I, I think, and this is my theory, and this is a theory I've had since Pokemon Go launched. Um, even though I've had a ton of fun with it, I think Niantic launched early. There was some pressure there, and they haven't quite figured out the logistics of how they want to do things. Pokemon Go, although it's fun, it's starting to sound and feel more like a chore. You know, what if I happen to get that raid, that exclusive raid invite, but what if I have something going on that day? Is my one chance to catch Mewtwo, or however many chances I get, am I screwed? Am I done? Like, am I, am I ever going to be able to catch? I haven't caught a legendary yet, so will I be able to catch these legendaries? And it's important to me, you know, but, yeah. I mean, it's not, like, super life priority, but it would be nice. So Does I agree. Do feel fun anymore? It's fun when I'm walking casually around like the boardwalk or down the street and there's a bunch of people around. That's fun. But there, when I see an Articuno or a Zapdos or a Moltres or a Lugia or now a Mewtwo and it's like, am I going to be able to get it? I don't know. That's stressful to me. So that that's the part that just kind of kind of sucks. Yeah. Like, I wonder what the catch rate is for Mewtwo anyway. Like, so is it also like the other ones where it's what, 2%? So it's like, okay, first of all, if you have to get you have to find a raid in the same area that Mewtwo will eventually spawn. Then right. somehow it will know this. It will maybe send you an invite. You have to see it and go to that place at that time. Then you got to battle the thing. Hope there's enough people there to help you battle it. If there's not, <laughs> bye. And then um, provided that there are other people, you you know, still right. might not even this be close so to stupid. getting it. Which it's I so just, stupid. Yeah, it's just to stupid. Me it doesn't sound fun. Like, like what if my invite fun. comes on my wedding day? I might have to cancel my wedding b- to Bora Bora to maybe no, catch Brit. a YouTube. No, Brittany, yeah. never. No. Cancel your wedding. <laughs> just kidding. Anyway, that's all. I just Hopefully we'll see some fixes. It's so stupid to design your game in a way that, like, actively discourages players from even trying. Like, I'm not going to... Yeah. I've been waiting for, you know, better Pokemon to come to Pokemon Go before I pick it up again. I did re-download it, and then I saw this Mewtwo news, and I was like, well, fuck that shit. I'm going back to my horny casino because it doesn't lock anything (laughs) other than its characters. I can play all the maps whenever I want, Um, which is basically what these raids are. It's like a map or a boss battle or something. I just think it's really stupid. It's really, really stupid. Hopefully they're, just, they're listening and we'll take the feedback. And, I mean, I'm sure they've lots heard of it. it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Which Hopefully they'll implement it. That either they just can't come up with a creative solution or they've seen the numbers and they realize that the numbers are already super small for people playing. I mean, I can't, I don't know. You know, I, I can't see their data, but I have to imagine they're making an informed decision on some end. Yeah. People don't usually just, do stuff to with the purpose of pissing people off. That's not right. typically how game design works. Um, but if their numbers drop, don't, don't you think they'd want to make this event something that would bring the numbers back up? Like this just seems like it's yeah. Not- but maybe they're focused on getting numbers back up in populated areas first, and then we'll roll out to less populated. You know how you areas. get numbers up in less populated areas? You don't lock your legendary character behind an invite. I'm totally on board with you. I'm just saying that I think that I we don't know what they're we can't see behind the curtain, right? Right. Right. So I'm just I'm wondering I would really like to know what the logic was behind this. Or if it was just literally oops. We forgot that people don't all live in metropolitan areas. Right. What's also kind of weird is that they're not giving the information that I think they, someone has to know on the Niantic team what these people want to know. What's the catch rate going to be? Is this going to be the only way you can catch Mewtwo? How long is it going to be available? Like those How are many questions. invites will you get? How many invites will you get? How frequently are the spawns going to be? These are all things that diehard Pokemon Go fans want to know, and they're not disclosing that information. So for that reason, I'm thinking there might be like, okay, get this information out. We'll, t- we'll cross these bridges when we get there. It's just odd that they would talk about this. Like Mewtwo was like the Pokemon that was advertised during the initial Pokemon Go trailer. Yeah. 
Yeah. Right. And, and it was a huge deal. And it's like everyone has been waiting for this moment. And here it is. And we don't have that much info on it. It's kind of weird, but we'll see. They might be using this Japan event, though, to user test. Uh, so or, Japan had a 100% catch rate. Um, so you just had to be there. You just had to be there and you got it. Yes. Well, so that I'm assuming is not going to be reflective upon. Uh, Japan gets everything. We'll see though. <laughs> well, it's a Japanese it, Japan. game. Eh. Yeah. So, eh. but maybe that's indicative of a higher than two per- two to three percent catch rate. Or maybe it's indicative of a hey, we fucked up our last event. Let's make sure this one goes right. But but JK, then uh-huh. you give everybody Mew that Mewtwo that went to that event that paid all that right. money to like go to <laughs> Chicago. Just give it to them. <laughs> Your travel is worth about six Mewtwo's. Here you go. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, it is really that how was. we're doing currency these days? Six and a half Mewtwo's. I like so, it. So six Mews yeah. and a, six Mewtwo's and a Mew. Oh yeah, yeah, we'll see. A Mew for good measure. Yeah, throw it in there. Give a minute. I'm gonna try. Well, Jesus. There's another Japanese game we're gonna talk about. Also makes me angry. Continue. Final Fantasy XV's Prompto VR shooter mode has been canceled. Wah, wah, wah. So, Alexa, when when did we first hear about this? Because my understanding is the information I have is incorrect. Before you say that, for people who are not familiar with this mode, it was originally revealed last year at E3 2016 when yeah. Square Enix said that this would be playable in VR in the form of a VR experience. It was showcased as a first-person light gun style mode in which you play as Prompto, who was sported in a snazzy PlayStation VR headset, and shoot enemies in their weak spots and teleport around the environment. This was actually a version of the Dusky demo Dusk where you, Dusk Guy demo, sorry, <laughs> where you played from Prompto's Prompto's from I'm totally a hard time today, you guys. Prompto's perspective. Uh. This is upsetting to me. Um, so yeah, <laughs> no, you are right. Shooty McShoot face. It was, wait, wait, we need we need to talk about this statement. That Square Enix. So oh, yeah. Square Enix said in a statement to GameSpot. Since then, we have learned much from the technology and have leveraged our learnings from the Episode Prompto DLC, which more or less sounds like they overestimated the technology in PlayStation VR and couldn't quite achieve what they were aiming for. You know what this sounds like to me. This sounds like they watched Alexa's stream and her bitching about how Final Fantasy should not be a shooter, and they were like, oh, crap, maybe we should just cancel this so, VR game. Hold, hold, hold on. I'm I blaming this back. on you, Alexa. I want to go <laughs> so, back to this. I want to break this statement down. Break it down, girl. <laughs> so this thing got released. Uh, not released. This uh, thing got announced, announced in E3 2016, back when PlayStation VR was a very large highlight of the PlayStation press conference and everyone was announcing something and they had that little thing play as prompto and the dusk guy demo, which was released in spring 2015, which was our first final fantasy 15 demo. The first of two, uh, you fight a behemoth and you make camp and stuff like that. So what this was, was that that chunk of the demo ish, uh, where you played, you played the encounter and the endeavor as prompto with his little guns, because I can't imagine they had had PlayStation VR long enough to figure out uh, how to make someone not sick doing Noctis's warp strike in first person. <laughs> yeah, um, that sounds like a barf simulator. Yeah, and like I played this, I played the Prompto Shooty Shoot at E3 last year, and it was a shooter in Final Fantasy 15, and it was small, and it was pretty cool. Like it was, it was a cool thing for Final Fantasy fans. Um, and something like something that someone like me and Brittany would absolutely like tear into and just love. It's an experience. It's an additional experience, like the Kingslave movie, like the anime. It, but you hated well. shooting things. I do in hate shooting things. Prompto. So, so here's. I mean, I loved episode Prompto. I'm bad at shooting things. Correction. I'm mm, bad okay. at shooting things. Um, <laughs> just just so, good. Okay. So when they announced Monster of the Deep, which is the VR experience that. Uh, is you as Noctis fishing. I kind of had a feeling in the back of my head, like, okay, that prompto shooting thing is dead because they realized uh, this might be easier to do like a fishing mini game or maybe fans took to the fishing more so they wanted to do the fishing. I haven't heard from anyone who like was over the moon about the fishing in Final Final Fantasy 15. It's fun, but it's not like the best thing. 
of the four guys' skills, it was probably the one I used the least. Um, so Square Enix canceling this is not surprising. It's their statement that bothers me. So their statement is one sentence. What's one sentence? Correct, Brittany? Yeah, that's what, yeah. That's what I got. Since Looks then, like it. being E3 2016, yep. we have learned much from the technology, assuming that's the PlayStation VR, mm -hmm. and have leveraged our learnings from the episode Prompto DLC. Yeah. Leveraged what learnings from the that people didn't like Prompto shooting, DLC. didn't like the shooter elements in a Final Fantasy game is right, what I'm but, assuming. But my question is, is it is it people complained? Because I go online and I like haven't seen too many people being like, oh my god, fuck this, it sucks. The shooting is bad. It's not the shooting that they complain about in that. It's the repetitive, the repetitive animations, the repetitive gameplay, and then the really awful, bad, stupid final boss fight for that DLC. maybe they just realized they couldn't make a shooter fun yeah you know what that that might be it but also thinking about thinking about it from a technology perspective and thinking about the technology that they utilized to make the third person shooter for the prompto dlc and then thinking about what they would need to make a first person shooter for playstation vr how many sh first person shooters got released for playstation vr if we're just looking at technology like half of them are first person shooters or have some sort of first person something mechanic. Mm -hmm. so, so there was one sentence that came before that statement, and it sentence? is Final Fantasy 15 VR experience at E3 2016 was the technology demo that we showcased. Just to be completely uh, clear. So they were, they're so basically that, saying this was never intended to be a full release game. It's like that Project Milo or whatever, right? From all no. of you. Oh my God. No. The creepiest <laughs> demo of all time. They said they were releasing it for PlayStation VR and they were making it. They said yeah. it was coming. Yeah, they definitely said it was releasing. So this is a little confusing a why backpedal. they would backpedal. But I think what we can maybe glean from this is that somebody on the inside saw this VR experience and said, yo dog, it's not good. We should just <laughs> not do this. Fishing. That's an idea. Fishing. I'm excited and for the fishing. Fun. Sometimes you want the whim the whimsical thing instead of the serious thing, and especially in relationship to, you know, the reaction and the feedback from this game as a whole. I don't think people, I mean, and you ladies could speak to this probably much better than I could, really loved that game because of how serious it was. It was like the little moments that you had with the guys on the road doing like the the stupid little stuff that really kind of built that whole game experience the the decision to make the initial decision to make a shooter uh thing was absolutely a decision by i i think by square to be like hey their big thing was this is a final fantasy for fans and first timers and they really wanted to make a game and accoutrement that appealed to the 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 general gamer not the hardcore not just the hardcore jrpg person which is why i think they made this a shooter but I think they realized that they weren't getting, I think they realized a long time ago, they were not getting the general gamer in for this game. They were getting the people that either started with, that are Final Fantasy fans that either started in the past couple of years with like 12 or 13 or whatever. I'm sorry if you started with 13. Um, or, <laughs> or, or, or people like me and Brittany that have been playing the series forever and we're like, we're going to find things to love about this no matter what, because this is in our blood and we'll take what you put around it and it'll be great because we love it and we enjoy it and we're going to play it. Um, I just, I don't know. I don't know. It just keeps every statement just sounds like, like, I don't know. We, we love the final fantasies. I love you Square Enix, but sometimes going on? the, the statements that are put out, whether it's regarding their online multiplayer or this VR experience, just sometimes they just don't make a lot of sense. Right. If it and, wasn't fun, yeah. like, Tabata, like, you're my home dog. Just tell me it wasn't fun. It's totally fine. It wasn't fun. It wasn't fun. Um, I do like the... I did play Monsters of the Deep at E3. I do like the fishing. I think it's really... I think it's really fun. It didn't make me sick the way that first-person shooting did. Um, but I am a little disappointed because I was looking forward to playing something from Prompto's point of view. Maybe they'll do other little VR experiments in the future. Just don't backpedal and call it a tech demo after you clearly said it was a thing. It's like the flip-flop of Final Fantasy VII. This is a tech demo. Oh, no, now it's a game. Yeah, here we go. Here's the quote. Um, at the time, 
we aren't thinking about marketing it as a separate project at all. It really is something extra to be enjoyed by the people who purchase the game. We're right. thinking it'll probably be a DLC release later for the game. It really is our core belief that we should satisfy the people who buy the game that we've made as much as possible. Yeah. We also want them to play for as long as possible too. So it really does help with that, gives them something extra. So yeah, it's the back backpedaling that's a little odd. Right, and also but Monsters of the Deep is like a separate thing you have to buy. So you don't get it if you play the game. I have this season pass and Monsters of the Deep didn't like, I think it's out. I don't know. I haven't played it yet. It's something I, I want to play, but I haven't it's played it fun. yet. It's fun. It is fun. It is really fun. All um, right. How many but, fish did you catch? Uh, quite a few. <laughs> also, they have scenes where you're like in the campfire and you can like talk to talk to the other dudes. See, you that's roast the, thing. the fish over the open fire. And that's the this thing I think I would fish. I would want like no, it's a not, VR. It's not out yet. It's not out yet. Oh. Ah. Yep. Soon. Wait, Britt, what were you saying? I was gonna say if if they're gonna put it in VR, I wouldn't want it for combat. I'd want it for little things. Like if you're in the car and you're going across the map and you're on a little road trip, that would be something fun to sit and experience in VR. Hopefully you wouldn't get sick. Like you could get sick on that. Or sitting around the campfire and chatting with your choker bros. Like that's the kind of VR I would want from a Final Fantasy game. And since right. they haven't done VR in Final Fantasy yet, I would be really I'm hopeful and I that they would test the waters and see how it's done. Because I think that could be a fun little addition. Yeah. That's not something that's ever necessary, but something that could be another layer of immersion, like Andrea said, to experience those little moments in the VRs. And so you can be prompt and look down and see how hot you are. That too. No, what you would know, would you Brittany, you would take a selfie and then you would t- it would just be a picture of you. Would you, would you not you, but as you as prompto. Ooh. You as hot blonde boy. Yeah. I mean, like, give us more stuff. I know that we are like we're like oh great they're asking us what more what more I just stuff want more we want God. Final Fantasy fifteen give us all the stuff I want all the stuff make another freaking movie I will watch but it five times again. would like, you want this game if it was just mostly an on rail shooter and there was like almost nothing and you like the only way you knew you were prompto was like your really pretty boy hands like yes, I don't know you know Final <laughs> Fantasy in the title and I'm a basic hoe Christine. <laughs> Yeah, I'm just saying if there weren't those moments like Brittany was just talking about, like where in the fishing game you go and you sit down with your bros and you like have a conversation or whatever, maybe they're just having a conversation without you. But like if 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 this ep- if this whatever VR experiment didn't have that in it and they just were doing a shooter thinking that they could get by with it and then they realized we're not that great at making shooters and maybe we should not do this. I think that's fine. Go ahead and do it. But yeah, you're right. This statement's a little bit weird. If I was a normal person, I would probably be like, no, I think I'll pass on that. No, thanks. Yeah, Uh, I'm with you, Alexa. We're going to check out anything. (laughs) Anything Final Fantasy 15. Yeah, you're going to check it out. All right. Well, normal people (laughs) listening to this show, um, you may be thinking to yourself right now, huh, I wonder if they're going to talk about that one big piece of news. Uh, It's very possible that we missed some news since we're recording the show a little bit earlier in the week this week than we normally do because I'm going out of town. I'm going home to Fargo. What are you going to do there? Oh, yeah. I'm going to a wedding. That was a weird accent I just did. Bagel bites? I'm going to... So there was some confusion (laughs) about the bagel bites when we last (laughs) spoke about them. So (laughs) I thought we were talking about bagel... Like the bagel holes, like you know, the center of the bagel. Yeah. Uh huh. So Wait, we you were, still call that bagel? We we talked about this on the last show. Yeah, she bagel. said bagel, and I was like, uh-huh. "Is that a labyrinth villain?" Um, <laughs> hey, <laughs> she was talking right. about. We were sitting at at like lunch or dinner, and she was like, "I put I put peanut butter on the bagel bites," and I went, "Okay," and I didn't think anything of it. And two days later, I'm putting on my makeup, and I turn to my boyfriend and I say, "Holy shit, Andrea puts peanut butter on bagel bites." <laughs> Thinking, <laughs> thinking, she was talking about the bagel bites. The pizza have, like, bagel bites. The pizza pep- bagel yeah, bites. Yeah. So I brought it up to her very aggressively the next time I saw her, and she was she like, did. and she was like, oh no, there's this bakery back home that makes bagel bites. That's like a donut hole, but it's a bagel, so it's a little bagel ball. Oh. And I put peanut butter on them, 
before I like did sports and I was Which like makes sense. oh because I was ready to like hardcore roast you for a gross food <laughs> she decision was, she came at me so heavy like you monster how dare it you bother put peanut me. butter on a bagel bite and I was like I mean, whoa, 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 peanut whoa, butter. Whoa, whoa. it would be <laughs> weird I mean I was fair. I was getting ready to try it I was like well it's you know this is the first time for everything <laughs> yeah I was like if Andrea does it it must be okay now so we have our next our next Patreon exclusive video we'll put we trying peanut butter, peanut butter on, on bagel bites like, yes <laughs> all right so what i was trying to say before we got distracted was that's the end of our first segment uh we will be back on the other side with some hands-on impressions we've played some video games and we're gonna talk about them and hopefully you ha- will want to play them too stick with us we'll be right back Welcome back. We are talking about video games. And um, we've all gotten to play a couple different uh, interesting things. So let's start with the old school Blue Wonder. Sanic. 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 Sonic the Hedgehog. Sonic Mania has been released. And it's pretty great. Yeah. Oh, man. Sonic's back. I can almost forgive him for kissing a human space. woman in 2006. <laughs> Whoa. Wait, what? What did you just say? Did you not play Sonic 2006? No, no. I didn't. No. No. Okay. So. That was Sonic, a real good face. <laughs> Sonic 2006. The 2006 Sonic like adventure game. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, there's a lot of like cutscenes and CGI. And it's like this really heavy story about a princess of a kingdom. And heavy. Sonic, and Sonic who's is a like who- helping the princess. Who's a human. human? This princess is a human. Okay. She is a human. So you have a human girl and then Sonic the Hedgehog rendered in all his CGI glory, like a this high, about like two and a half feet, whatever, giant blue hedgehog. Uh, and then a human, human looking woman, not like Dr. Eggman cartoony, like actual human woman. Like she is a woman huh. of the human okay. race. And they have a romance. And there is a scene, uh, it, if you get a different, one of the endings, I believe, there is a scene where they uh, they kiss. Like, like platonically touch. or no, like? like romantically they kiss. Mm. And there's like some weird dialogue like with another character like leading into like, well, do you, do you love her? And then he like catches her. And remember that awful scene in the Star Wars prequels where Padme and Anakin are rolling around in the field together? That happens with Sonic and a human woman. That's weird. Ow. He's a hedgehog it's for bad. one. I well, yeah, that's just weird. At that point, it was weird and bad. That sounds well, like a great time to jump off the Sonic train. Well, uh, yeah. The good news for you <laughs> is off. that there are no human women in Sonic Mania. Oh, it's so it's great. It's all old school Sonic. There are a couple special stages that give us the 3D Sonic, but uh, for the most part, it's... That classic side-scrolling, speedy gameplay that we all remember from the Sega Genesis. So I um, never had good. Sega Genesis, so I don't remember it from there. <laughs> Wait, what? But you I never played it. one at all, ever? Uh, Genesis? Yeah. Um, I don't think so. We were a PC family at that point, and I didn't have many other friends that played video games. Oh. So. We need to remedy this. I'll bring a Genesis. Okay. We'll pop you all Genesis cherry, girl. Okay. You know they have oh, those Jesus. those retro consoles that are coming out, too. I don't want to buy them. Nope. I'll bring a legit <laughs> Genesis with a wonky-ass controller. It'll be great. Yeah, oh, I'll just play Britney's. That's fine. Yeah. No, it's fine because growing up, I was a Super Mario person. Um, the Sonic games... For some reason, I never really got into them as a wee lass. I don't know if it's because I felt like the game played itself so often. You know, like you get on like a roll and you're going over loop de loos and you're getting rings and you don't even know what's happening. You have no control over it. Whereas that, whereas with like Super Mario World, it's very kind of slow paced. You know, you control every movement. There's no physics really involved. So this is, I would say, one of my first real experiences with the old Sonic games. And I'm having a lot of fun. It's a, you know, I'm 29. I waited long enough. I played a little bit back in the day. I don't think I got much farther than Green Hill Zone, but this is good. It's fun. It's, and I like the first zone. 
<laughs> yeah, that's, no, that's what I'm saying. She knows. She knows. Number one. <laughs> yeah, that's what, I, that's what I'm getting at. It's like back in the day, I didn't get much farther than that because for uh, whatever reason, I wasn't into it. So yeah, I'm like experiencing it for the first time now that I'm old and mature. And that's, it's fun. That's excellent though. And I think that yeah. there's a lot of people like you out there that have never played Sonic or haven't only played a little bit of it. And now hopefully they're going to um, get a chance to really experience Sonic in all its glory. And I think what's great about this story is not only has Sega done an excellent job of launching this, but they put together a team that did it right. You know, yes. the this development crew of fans who are all about the fan service in this game and who are part of the Sonic community and who said, hey, like Sega, like, let us do this for you. And Sega said, sure, I let's love, do it. I love that they did that. Like, that's such a big example of a publisher, developer, like listening to fans, like actually bringing them in to work on it. I love it. Good job, Sega. You did a thing and it was good. So, so besides the the main mode, which is what I've been playing, I think I'm at the, I can't remember the name of it. I'm at like maybe like I'm the at the Green Hill Zone. <laughs> yeah, I'm at the Green Hill Zone. So yeah. other than that, what other things are there to do in Sonic Mania, Andrea? Because I think you're further. You've um, done more. So the time attack mode is kind of the the big thing in this because mm -hmm. it's all about those leaderboards. And what I love about time attack is you know that you can instantly load back in so this is something i talked about during my preview session is that when you're in time attack mode when you're going through if you make a mistake like if you like hit the spikes or you lose all your rings or whatever you can press one single button and you're instantly at the start of the uh zone again and you can keep you can run right through it so that's a that's a really fun part of the game that i think is something that fans in particular are gonna love I also saw that there's bonus. I think it's Knuckles and Knuckles. It's something you can unlock. Have you seen that? Oh, yes, I so have. Was, so there was a secret, a secret mode that I saw a story about today that God, Knuckles is the greatest. That was put I into know. the game. Let me, I had a crush on Knuckles what? back in the day. I was more of a Tails girl. It was. It wasn't Knuckles like the creature. It was more like the personality. I felt like he was a badass. And back when I was little, I was like, "Hey, hey. Alexa, what are you doing? No, <laughs> I see that face you're making. It was more of like the personality. Brit, of like, you oh, know badass. what? You are totally normal. Would you I say? thought I was going to grow up and marry Donatello from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. So <laughs> would you call it's Knuckles fine. a husbando? Ah, uh, no, that's you know, weird. No, that's yeah. I wouldn't say that. I would. Yeah, I was. I weak. forgot. My hormones were weird. It was a weird situation. Donatello was my first husbando, and I just Dang. totally forgot about him. I oh. feel like a jerk. Okay. That's fine. Some husbando he was. He Damn. was, no, legitimately <laughs> thought he was number one real. Number two, totally <laughs> normal to marry a giant mutated turtle. Like, that's just See, what I thought. You, I wouldn't suspect it from. <laughs> but... <laughs> You yeah, said you would expect it from that. Brittany. I What's don't know why. I was just, I'm just I'm just shocked <laughs> that the words that came out of that came out of Brittany's mouth were a a positive positive biosexual response to Knuckles the Akin. <laughs> Sometimes I do this show with you ladies and I'm like, what? is going on. And you regret everything. No, never. <laughs> no regrets. Yes. Um, so this story over on Polygon says, Sega is embracing a fan favorite <laughs> joke. <laughs> In Sonic Mania, players can run through some <laughs> retro style levels either, as either Sonic Tails or Knuckles, but a special hidden mode adds a perfect twist on, a, on the gameplay by calling <laughs> back to a classic Sonic goof. Since the release of Sonic 3 and Knuckles, an expansion to the Sega Genesis game Sonic the Hedgehog 3, fans have taken to adding on the and Knuckles suffix <laughs> <laughs> any number of things like other movies and games <laughs> not that people stop there of course They're, they showed a photo here of donut taco palace three and knuckles <laughs> it's like an actual <laughs> store um <laughs> sonic mania does the same thing with its own and knuckles mode where knuckles follows the playable character around a la tails now it doesn't matter who you're playing as for this to work so you can even make sonic mania into knuckles and knuckles <laughs> If you want to, let's play Knuckles and Knuckles. <laughs> we could do this to unlock the end Knuckles mode. You need to collect medals from the bonus stages scattered throughout the main levels. It's one of several features hidden in Sonic Mania, which of course launched on consoles and PC. So uh, we'll leave the rest for you to discover. 
It's so yeah. good. I'm so happy, Sega. Like, you did the thing for the fans. Like, I really feel like this game is for the people it was made for. Like, so many games have parts in it that are, like, very clearly, like, I don't want to call it, like, like artistic fapping, but clearly is like, <laughs> we made this for us, not for you, but it's for you. Um, <laughs> I like wh what? No, it's good. <laughs> I, no, it's great. I love sure. it. I, shirt. Yeah, the artistic the fapping. The on a shirt. Um, very, very. Some some games are real fappy. Um, so I like like there's the old stuff and then the new stuff. Very just mimics that. It, like it's just seamlessly in there. You can tell that it was made by people that really understand the source material and understand what made it special to the people that played it then and the people that have continued to be a part of that fandom. Like, it embraces fandom. Like, I was talking about with Fire Emblem Heroes, Horny Casino last week. It embraces fandom in a way that is just, like, smart and inclusive. And I, that's probably what I like most about Sonic Mania. Good job, Sega. You did it. Yay. Yay. Sega. Sell lots of units. Congratulations. Now Good gerb. So um, in Sonic, even though I haven't played your game, good Sonic job. Sonic Explosions, the one that's <gasps> coming out later this year, next year, the like post-apocalyptic Sonic, the gritty Sonic. Sonic, oh, what's it called? What's it called? It's Sonic Forces. Sonic Forces. That's it. Mm. And it's coming. I thought out. you just called it Sonic Explosions. Yeah, she did. That's what it looks okay. like. It's the trailer was like a gritty, dark, fiery. The world was on fire, and Sonic was the only man who could save it. Sonic's not a man. Sonic was the only hedgehog who could save it. <laughs> ah. <gasps> Let's see, buddies. So, Brittany. <sighs> yes. You've been playing some stuff. Yeah. I so have. I saw that you were playing, um, what was that, Fable Fortune? I have, yeah. And that's the what card game that just that's came, the came out card recently. Game that we were all a little bit salty about. How do you play? Um, yeah. How do you play? So I've never played a deck building digital card game like this before. So I have no real references to like take it back to. Um, but what I like about it, what drew me to it, is that it's cooperative or you can play PvP. And so they have, as of right now, it's very early still, very buggy. The game crashes at least like three or four times. Mm. Um, but, and they just included friend invites with the last patch, which I think was like five or six days ago. Um, so it's cooperative, and that's the only way I've been playing it. And so you have about five different classes to choose from right now. I think more are coming. And you get class-exclusive cards. You get cards that can be used for any class. And then you get rare cards that can be uh, one per deck. And you have these bosses to take down. And the it's not like you have like a whole bunch of levels to go through as these classes and defeat with one class. It encourages you to try all the different classes, and that's what I've been doing. I've been playing with Jason, and it's very challenging in the sense that you have to master all these different classes. The deck building is really fun. I think I have over like 400 cards right now, and it's fun to like choose which ones you want to do and use. Um, so that's what I've been playing the most of, and it's fun. I would encourage anyone who wants to do some strategy with their significant other or a friend, or you can even play online, and it has features that allow you to do so. So you can play with strangers. It's a good time. I saw that you also played another game <laughs> that, that I want to hear you talk about. Fire Emblem Heroes, the Horny Casino. Why did so you start playing? I, I was, I was, I don't know. I just thought of you, and I was like, I hey, Horny know. Casino. You were like... I want to get Alexa. You know, sounds a little good. Casino. I think. Oh, I know what it was. I was gonna play Horizon, but my controller was dead, so I was waiting for it to charge. <laughs> I was like, "What am I gonna do? I'll check Can't out the Horny just Casino." Plug it in and play while it charges. My mm -hmm. charging cord is like a foot long, and my couch is like twenty feet back. So I didn't, and it's on the we big can projector. Fix this problem for you. It's called I know, Amazon. I, <laughs> I know, Andrea. <laughs> stop using your logic against hey. me. That. Hey. For, if it was not for this misfortune, I would not have played the Horny Casino. There's okay. a silver lining to everything. Uh, so I'm playing Fire Emblem Heroes, and it's fun. The, the part I'm struggling with, Alexa, is I feel an obligation to level every single hero I get, and that's okay. kind of taking up my time. How do you deal with that? Um, I built, uh, I built three, three teams and just rotate through them, and they all have different... Um, in each one, I have at least one ranged person, one sword, one spear, one... Uh, maybe one tome or whatever, one wild card, whatever. Um, but I have four teams, and uh, no, three teams, and on some of these teams, I have, like, doubles of characters. Like, I use one character on two teams mm -hmm. um, because terrains... 
terrain on the map will change and the amount um, and the different types of people you'll be up against will change. Um, I also make sure I have one person who um, is a Pegasus Knight so they can fly over water if there's water. So I built those three teams with my favorite characters and then I just rotate through them and that's it. I don't touch like 75% of the characters in that game because they're all oh. garbage. <laughs> Only put the people you want to bang in your party. Pretty much. I have a pretty bangable party. Who's your party right now? Uh, it's all of the main. I'm really bad with all the names. It's the Anna. Is that her name? Anna. Yeah. Anna. And then the people below her, her, the silver haired people. Oh, Alphonse and girl yeah. I never use. Alphonse and his sister. <laughs> and then uh, the, the archer. Anyway. So th this is why I've run into issues with fire emblem. Anyways, I get all these characters and I, I can't help it. Like I have this urge and this desire and need to level all of them up and have them all be useful. And then I get overwhelmed and then I stop. So but I'm going to try not to do that. Don't do that because if you focus in on several, on a few characters, as you earn, um, as you do the other trials in the game and you earn like crystals and crystal shards and all those other little materials through doing quests and just naturally playing the game, you'll accumulate all, by naturally playing the game, you'll accumulate all these things. Um, you can use them to unlock potential so you can level up a three star to a four star to a five star so you can buff the characters that you really, really like. I've been working for about s all six months now on getting my two star Donald to a five star Donald and he's almost there. Um, Donald is the one with the pot on his head. <laughs> pot boy. Um, pot, pot boy. Um, and then you can also level them up. I have a level 40 um, Camilla that I've just been leveling up like crazy and I'll give her an extra bump if she's not getting enough EXP because she's so high level. And if you do a low level map, you don't get a lot. Um, mm -hmm. But I really honed in on those characters because some of the some of the trials and some of the challenges coming out now, like just recently they had the art director for Fire Emblem Awakening uh, create a set of maps with his own team and they released it and they're his maps and they're they're incredibly hard and you can only play them on hard mode. It was a couple uh, weeks ago. And my team wasn't, two of my teams weren't high enough level, but one of them was. So they are putting in extra harder content for people like me that play it constantly and obsessively. So I would suggest picking your favorites based on class or weapon or the character or whatever, and just really honing in on them. And that's totally okay. You can, you can sacrifice all the characters that you get. Like I like collecting them, but you can sacrifice some character skills, like take their skills and teach them to a different character, or you can send them home and just get them out of your inventory entirely, or you can <laughs> actually merge them with another character and all their skills and points and stuff will go into that character that you want to bulk up. So just, I guess, keep sacrificing the characters you don't want and really hone in on the ones that you care about, I guess. Noted. That's deep. Yeah. So they're kind of like Pidgeys. Oh, make oh yeah, the candy. Yeah, exactly. There's that was great, Andrea. The other Pidgeys. <laughs> there's, a there's a couple of characters that are just straight garbage that I keep drawing that I just want to, like, roll on the ground and die if I get one more. <laughs> but I will let you know as the horny casino advances. Yes, send me updates. Also, keep the animations on when they attack because when they get – when their HP is low and they get shredded, their clothes shred. I didn't know this. Like, yeah, they they're, get they're, naked? They're, their clothes shred in some very suggestive areas. There's one enemy that you what? fight that's this giant guy with a with a tome. And when he's low in health, the artwork that that shows on screen for him is his shirt has just completely exploded off. And it is just abs for days. Yeah. And then like a noted. book covering his privates? No, he's wearing oh. his pants still. His <laughs> pants are mostly still on. But oh. his shirt Boo. literally his shirt is literally I don't like, drawn, this <laughs> like it exploded off of his body. Like yeah, he it hulked did. out of it. So it's what so you're great. telling me is I want to get all of my characters to as low of HP as possible. Basically. I mean, it's an incentive not to heal them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, <laughs> Andrea, casino experiences <laughs> aside, that's a really creepy laugh. I like it. <laughs> yeah, um, Andrea, I want to hear you talk about lawbreakers. I do too. Okay, me three. So there was a news story going around last week that I was kind of like, I don't know why this is a news story about how the numbers for lawbreakers is low that the the concurrence on Steam are lower than when Battleborn launched and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, huh, 
that's weird because it was in like the top selling games and like it's a it's a perfectly fine game so lawbreakers is made by boss key which is run by clifford blazinski of unreal tournament and gears of war fame formerly of epic he mm-hmm. left he left video games and then came back to video games and started this studio and has a you know bunch of people working for him creating this first person arena shooter it's available on pc and ps4 it's at a $29.99 price point because he got up on stage at the PC gaming show at E3 this year and said, I don't believe in charging people for all the extra bullshit when it's just a multiplayer game. So I was I appreciate that. And I think, you know, gamers out there who also don't like getting charged for crap they're not getting appreciate that as well. It has yep. microtransactions in the game for customizable uh, cosmetic stuff skins for your guns skins for your characters etc and mm-hmm. um it's an interesting fast-paced arena shooter i mean at, at its core that's what it is and people are saying that they feel like the gameplay is similar to overwatch in a certain sense but i don't really feel that way there are objectives within the arena it's not just like team deathmatch but it doesn't feel have that same kind of um cartoony vibe that overwatch has i mean overwatch is very much a hero shooter and while there are heroes with specific abilities and classes in this game it doesn't feel it doesn't feel the same for some reason okay maybe that's just because there's more characters in overwatch to choose from um but the- do you feel like oh sorry go ahead no 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 oh. go ahead I was going to say, do you feel like it's just that Blizzard does such a better job fleshing out backstories for these characters? Like, so you really feel like they have an identity, whereas I can't I can't name any hero from Lawbreakers or even tell you what they look like. Yeah, no, I mean, that's a that's a fair that's a fair criticism that the lore of the game is light from what I've seen. And I got frustrated because I, on PS4, as of right now, when we're recording the show, there is no tutorial. And I don't need oh. I don't need a tutorial oh. to tell me how to shoot stuff. Like, Overwatch's tutorial is a little bit like we're going to hit you over the head with like, this is how you move. This is how you shoot a thing. <laughs> I don't right. need that. But what's unique about Lawbreaker is, is the gravity movement system so there are certain points of the of the map where you are in gravity and then there's certain points where you're not in gravity and so getting to know how that movement mechanic works would have been nice to have a tutorial or at the very least some kind of training uh match where i could like test the jumping out because all of the characters have movement that's a little bit different like this one character this assassin character has a grappling hook that she can throw and and attach to the world and like pull herself through the world which is uh which is really cool sorry i didn't hear what you said there steimer i said i said she's like catwoman like like whipping herself around the map kind of thing Sort of. It doesn't move that fast. Um, it moves okay. a little bit slower because you know you're in like zero g, so you're. It's not like a really quick movement. Okay. But it's um, it's really interesting. And then some characters can slide and have abilities tied to their slide. And I kept trying to figure out like how do I slide because there's not really like a crouch button or I just didn't find the crouch button even though I've looked at the control schematic more than once now. Crouching is hard. And. In order for me to learn about each of the individual characters, you have to select them in match, and then oh. you have to like read a menu about their abilities while you're in the match. Oh no no! And oh, I'm like, this is sad. not ideal. No 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 For no. me to be like reading what all the abilities do while you know the PvP yeah. action is is happening. That's odd. So, you know, and I and I don't clearly the, there's been like an oversight in not putting that in the ps4 version because it's i've been told that there is a tutorial in the pc version of the game so oh. hopefully they can fix that and add that in is so there a way to nice? just make like a bot match so you can go in and like screw around against npcs you can make private matches i haven't attempted to do so yet because I felt okay. like the best way for me to earn XP and start leveling at my characters was just to throw myself into the, into the deep end of the PvP matches, even though I knew that I was going to kind of, you know, like, suck a little bit for the first couple of hours. But here's what I like about it. It's the, it's really, like, the mechanics feel really crisp. They're really tight. They are really well done. The shooting feels nice, very snappy. 
The movement feels good. The graphics look good. There's the the guts of this game seem really polished, which is excellent because if that was missing, then this game would be doomed. I think that this game could benefit for from a little bit more onboarding for people who want to get into you know an arena shooter but maybe never spent time doing it if this was a pc only game i could maybe get a i could maybe tolerate the well hey it's a pc arena shooter like that's the thing it's a fast-paced fps if you're not ready to hang with that you're not ready to hang but it's not they're trying to come into the console market as well and, and appeal to that audience and that audience isn't necessarily used to that style of gameplay I mean, clearly, you know, you have things like Halo and Call of Duty and whatnot, but Mm -hmm. this specific type of arena shooter has predominantly been popular on PC. So, you know, I I don't know if I am just need more time with it, which I clearly do, but I haven't yet gravitated towards these characters as people, even though they do have some fun, like, quippy one-liners that they'll throw out in in the arena. Like, they'll, like, talk about, you know... Uh, they'll react to each other, which is nice. So like I make a really cool kill. One of the other players will like say a line of dialogue at me, which is nice. But you don't get to choose that line of dialogue. Like in mm-hmm. Overwatch, I, you know, they have lines that you can choose to say to each other. Um, I hope they add in some more customization in that sense. It'd be nice to be able to have some kind of communication system with the other people that I'm playing with. So, do you think this game has potential to go places and it'd be known as, like, the PvP experience? Or do you think it's lacking something? Sadly, is you know, well done as the gameplay feels. I just think that there's just too much competition in this space for this to really make a dent. And Overwatch is just, like, crushing it right now. And they're so similar to people who don't stop to actually look at the differences that you kind of got to go, well, I know that you're, I know from playing both of these games that they are not the same game. But to somebody scrolling through the PlayStation Store, scrolling through Steam, like I don't know if they're going to stop to take a look. I don't know if there's a hook in this game that's going to grab people enough to to make them stop and take interest. And that, that mm-hmm. kind of sucks because I know that Boss Key put a lot of time into making this game and making it play well. And is there room for improvement? Yeah, but I don't think it's kind of like you kind of look at it and go, hey, you could have made a flawless game in every sense of the word. And it still might not have made a difference. Because I don't know if the core concept of what Lawbreakers is and the lore behind it and the character design and the world that they're in is intriguing enough. Mm. Right? Because none of you have played it yet, right? No, no. And I know that you all, you know, generally don't play shooters. No. But for people like you who don't play shooters, was there anything about anything that you've seen that was intriguing to you about this game? The biggest selling point for me was that Cliff was on it, honestly. Yeah, like, I don't yeah. know enough about the game. I just know this is his game. And um, personally, I, I like him as a, you know, but um, if I was just a, a fan who knew nothing about it, I would just know like, hey, Cliff's a part of it. Ah, and that's it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, I think it looks interesting, like just like you said. It, but it's both a pro and a con for me. It looks really fast, and part of me is like, "Oh, cool," and then part of me is like, "I probably can't keep up." So I'm not really sure I even want to bother trying. Whereas, and and the other part that I'd mentioned, the character thing, is really like I don't play Overwatch, but I know so many characters in Overwatch, and it makes me it it it's in the back of my brain is like kind of want to try it. Just because I want to see those characters and I, I want to mess around with them, and I think that that's a big hook for players like me who don't play a lot of shooters like that. So the fact that Lawbreakers is sort of missing that element might hurt them in the long run. But IDK might be a fifth <laughs> No, it, I mean it's not. A, I, I think it's not an. I don't know. I think it is. I think it is going to hurt them in the long run that these characters. I mean, and they also have a very diverse lineup of characters, just like Overwatch does. But they just aren't as imaginative. Mm-hmm. You mm-hmm. know, like the characters in Overwatch just are in a, a league of their own, so to speak. Yeah. And um, 
yeah i hope the that fact they that can, i can I look at it they can find an audience though i hope that they can find a a, a crew of players who really love that fast-paced arena shooting uh gameplay and i hope they find success because you know i think that they did a good job of building this game just needs a little it just needs a little dash of something a little something, something. A little some some a little je ne sais quoi who <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of shooters and Overwatch, oh, geez. Alexa, uh, I'm very excited. Um, so I put this on the rundown for this week. Can I say? Can I read what you put on the rundown? Yes. Please do, because yes, I can. lost my shit. I laughed so hard yes, by myself. Let me adjust myself. So in our show notes, under where it's Alexa's place to write what game she's playing this week, it says, "A lesson in futility. It's too late for me." And Overwatch by Alexa Ray. <laughs> I would read this if it was an essay. I'm just saying. Maybe I'll write it. I don't know. So, <laughs> so I. Okay. This this is a bit of a story. So get a snack. <laughs> get a snack. Um. So Overwatch came out last May when I was recovering from a very significant concussion. Um. It came out while I was like basically out cold and sequestered from society and recuperating. And when I came back to the civilized world and went back to work at GameSpot at the time, I still could not play Overwatch because it made me like the vertigo and the movement and the intensity I could not handle. Prior to this, the only time I had gotten my hands on Overwatch was at a preview event, uh, a public preview event. I believe it was PAX. Um, where I would walk out of the base in question and immediately get sniped by better players constantly. No matter what angle I walked out, no matter what exit I walked out of, I would just get sniped, respawn, and I basically spent the whole game respawning because I wanted to walk out into the game and I wanted to see the game and I wanted to see what other players were doing, but that game moves so fast, you don't get the opportunity to do so. Um, so it's great that Overwatch has this giant meta narrative that occurs and is very much explored outside of the game because there's no way in fuck you can do it in the game. Um, so I missed the boat on Overwatch and I've watched my friends get obsessed with it. I've watched my friends cosplay it. I can recognize m you put a character in front of me. I can name it because like Christine was saying, th there's characters are just so have so much personality and Blizzard has done such a good job with them. It's like, you know who they are, even if you don't play the game. Yep. So a, a little over a year after missing the Overwatch boat, I decided to swim out and try and catch it. Um, my, I had a friend. <laughs> You're like Ariel in The Little Mermaid when she loses yeah. her fins. <laughs> She's That's like, me. Flounder, please come help me. That's me just like, <laughs> Overwatch? <laughs> um, so I had a friend stay with me last week and I had some things to take care of while she was here and I had never played Overwatch before because I have a zillion things going on in my life I do a lot of stuff and if I'm going to play a game I'm going to play the game of the mo moment I'm going to play what um, what everyone's playing I'm going to play a sh experience that doesn't require me to put hundreds of hours into it that's ongoing I need something with an ending point so she's playing Overwatch because she freaks out and is like, oh, my God, like the summer skins are out. I have to get the skins. Can I play on your PlayStation while you do whatever you have to do? And I'm like, yeah, sure. So I watched her play and I saw the his name isn't Dad 76. It's Soldier 76. But I heard him as Dad 76 <laughs> because yes. that's what the Overwatch <laughs> fandom calls him. And yeah. I've read so much Overwatch like like comics and fan fiction. Whenever I get the joke, I know it. Um, and I saw his outfit, which is literally like a barbecue dad outfit. It's got the khaki shorts, the button down shirt and like the grill apron with all nice. the grill tools in it. And I saw that and I was like, okay, that's really clever. And my friend explained to me like, yeah, you know, it's a riff on dad 76. And I'm like, I know dad 76. And she looks at me and she goes, but you don't play overwatch. And I was like, judgy make a judge face. I was like, oh, so she left. And what did I do? I so she left. Her. Because I, I kicked up, her out. <laughs> I booted up Overwatch. And I started from the beginning, did the tutorial. The terrible tutorial. The ter it's not a good tutorial. It's not good. It's not for people <laughs> like me. And, I, and the same thing that happened with me, that happened when I played it that those many, many moons ago, I just would run into the field or I would stop and I would assess and I would think I was creeping out somewhere 
and I'd be instantly killed. Like instantly, like goodbye, you're done. That's it. I spent more time dying and respawning than I did actually getting to do anything. And I shot Who did someone you play like as? once. Um, I played as, uh, I started as Tracer, which I realize is not a great starter character. Yeah. So I played as uh, McCree because I was like, dude with guns. This is you might do better with like a diva. Even I'm, I'm like and talking I, I as if diva. I know I this game. game. I know. I, try, but try I know that she's got like a tanky mech. I'm just like no. thinking of something that will help either shield you. Yes. Or you know have but, a separate target. No, I did. I did. I tried. I tried uh, uh, several characters, and I struggled for several hours with this just being like oh no i'm gonna do it this time i'm stopping to enjoy i'm enjoying the scenery a little too much maybe i should move a little faster because it's overwatch yeah right? you can't watch anything just go so watching I, is over but i'm playing with what i'm assuming are all these like people that have been playing this game for much 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 longer and are very good at it and are just like they know where to camp or where to stand to get players as they come out of their spawn point. They know where, what to do exactly to nail certain characters. They know these maps inside and out already. And after my like eighth or ninth match of struggling with this, being like, no, I really want to get this. I realized that the exercise for me personally was totally futile. And I will probably have to let Overwatch go and just admit that it's a game with a meta that I really enjoy and really respect uh, the work that they went into it. But the game itself is like, I I can never have it. Like I no, can never I, do it. I'm surprised I want to help you. shepherd you now. I feel like we could do, we could do this. I'm not, I'm not a total, I'm bad at shooting things, but I'm not a total dum dum. I just feel like <laughs> it's at the point with the game where like the community is like, yeah, we, we got it. And, for someone like me who comes in and is like, hello, and just gets like <laughs> shot like, immediately to death without like, without, oh. you know, any like real like thought or whatever. I just, it's like, I, I will either be that teammate that holds everyone back. And I had like awful flashbacks to that one Dota game I played. Oh no. And like, I, I would really love to be able to play Overwatch. I'm not a shooter person, but as I like, go into the world and listen to you talk about like Paragon and listen to like, in like, and like call of duty and listen to like all the stuff that you guys play. It's like, you know what? I want to be a part of these communities and I want to play it because if people love it, it must be really great. So I want to know why it's great rather than just take it on other people's work. But you were playing alone, right? Yeah. So like that might be it. Like Andrea could be Reinhardt and you could be a healer of some kind. And like, you can just go around together and I'm sure you would have a much better time. You've never played Overwatch, Stammer? No. Damn, girl. Oh, you know you're... <laughs> <laughs> I, I did go to the Overwatch uh, qualifiers at Blue yeah. I also and appreciate I you immediately I... degrading me to the White Mage, so thank you. Hey, uh, I'm just saying. Nice. It's a really <laughs> fun... Pl- no, that's, really what fun looking around? that's what I hear. No, but that's here's the I thing. Hear. I think what Stammer's trying to say is if you're I was not... Just if you. you're not really well-versed in shooting mechanics meaning if you're not really good with like the the snapping the scope no scope headshots sniping knowing when to shotgun knowing when to have a mid-range weapon really like getting a feel for those mechanics then it's good to start as a support character so that way you can just feel like you're contributing to your team by keeping your teammates alive and helping them do the shooting until you get real comfortable with the maps. You get a little bit more comfortable seeing how some of the characters play with you in the matches. And then you can start trying characters like Soldier 76, who is a great beginner character. Um, so that way you can get you know a little bit more comfortable with the mechanics. And here's the thing about these games, and it was hard for me at first because it's really easy to get overwhelmed and frustrated and rage quit and say, mm-hmm. fuck it, this isn't for me. I, I don't want to do it. I sad quit. Oh, you were just Aww. like, mm-hmm. I was <laughs> defeated. I was defeated. <gasps> it's Play just, of the um, game. You my, really, uh, my dignity being shattered. Yeah, but you really just have to practice so much. I know. And that's why I feel like the boat has sailed because I don't have like the desire to practice. Well, no, it's not that I don't right. have a desire to practice. It's like I just genuinely don't have the, like I don't really have the time. Like I would have yeah. to like definitely reshuffle some some priorities you might have to take a break from slutty casino well i play slutty casino like in the car on the train or like 
in in places like if I'm like waiting for my soup to heat up or whatever. Like, <laughs> that's my, like when I'm standing there and I'm just like slutty yeah, time. Understand. Um, but I want to I want to get into it because so many people like it. I want the there's so you want to be part of the thing you're having FOMO there's so many husbands yeah. in that game well not only that I just I'm sort of obsessed with their branding yeah and so like I love the fact that I can look at the little rabbit thing and be like it's diva like I've never you know I, like, how the hell do I know that I have never played this game but I know this and like, there's just so many little things like that I'm like I feel like I'm part of it even though I'm not I'm I, I feel like a yeah. fraud because like yeah. I made an I need I healing like joke fraud, once in front of a bunch of people that play Overwatch and they were like, oh, that was a good use of the I need healing joke. And I was like, haha. And then they said something else. And I was like, you're going <laughs> to find out that oh, I'm God. an imposter. They know I'm a fake. So That's like, when you Homer what? Simpson back into the bushes. Like, <laughs> yeah, pretty much. But Bizzard, Bizzard, Blizzard builds. Like, they build their games for longevity, and I feel like Overwatch is going to be around for a long time, and I'm going to be sitting on the sideline being like, Hanzo main? Like, I, like <laughs> why do I, we... oh, I want to, like, I want to be a part of that, and I want to learn it. I just, like, and if you're listening to this and you have tips for me, please, for love of God, like, tweet at me, help me out here. I want... I want to get into Overwatch. It no longer makes me want to dizzy puke die. So I want <laughs> I want it to happen. That's an improvement. What? Well, <laughs> if it doesn't happen, Alexa, you and I can do horny casinos. We can do Final Fantasy 15 VR on the sidelines. It will be okay because I will probably never be a part of the Overwatch. No, then us three, the Overwatch. Alexa, Andrea, me, because I also want to try it. Like we can just band together and go. I think because those games are no fun, in my opinion, if you're by yourself. Like though it's a team based game. This is an idea. You're solo. It's kind of crappy. Um. So, but if you've got friends, it can be like, even if we're all like getting sniped over and over again, we can still talk and like make jokes and have fun. Exactly. And we won't be mad if you're dragging the team down because we'll be dragging it down together. Yeah. Oh, we'll all go down, go down together. together. <laughs> exactly. What's that chain smoker song? We go down. We all go down together. If we wait. Yeah. Oh yeah yeah yeah. 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 If we <laughs> Just, yeah. go down, then we go down together. Yep, that's the one. Yep. Our we new won't theme. Get the play of the game, but maybe <laughs> we'll do better. <laughs> Nailed it. You're turning into me. I like it. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> um, Steimer, I know we talked a lot about Pyre last week. Did you have additional thoughts? I'm liking it even more, basically. Um, and I don't even I'm gonna spoil characters for you. I don't care, I'm sorry. Um, Wait, so just so you know, she's going to spoil characters for you. If you want to skip ahead to the next section, you can. Yeah. Okay, you've been um, warned. You've been warned. There's an adorable worm, Sir Gilman, and I'm in love with him because he's great. <laughs> okay. Is he his I, No. Okay. He's a worm. He's, he's charming. I mean, he's, he reminds me of Sir Didymus from Labyrinth. Like, Amazing. Really, Really overconfident, but also can come through. Like he's not it's not based on nothing. He's got some skills. Um so you have a thing for like reptiles and like I didn't say he was his bando. No, not his bando. no, Britt threw that in there trying to force Husbando into the conversation. It's okay to just like an animal character for it being a cool animal. We're yes. talking to Steimer here. But I won't interrupt with more husbando. No husbando talk. <laughs> No, he's not. He's, I don't like him in that way. He's just a friend. Okay. <laughs> friendo. He's a friendo. Um, and then there's, I already forgot her name, but the harpy character you get, I think is really cool too. Um, and I'm just like, I'm just digging it more and more. Like, is there adding more people and it's changing the elements of the game and you play it differently? Although I screwed up. So I'm like, I'm playing the harpy like I'm playing. Nope, can't do that. Oh crap. Like she's dead. Whoops! Like, uh, so I'm definitely having a little bit of a learning curve because they do throw so many characters at you, um, but I'm still like super into it and want to play more. Have you found yeah. a good balance for who you want to level up and who you don't? Because that was my challenge. As they kept adding additional characters, I was like, "But I want to level everybody up." No, I never. I am not that person in games. I very clearly like pick my favorites and go for them like Faye never use her don't like her not not that I don't like her as a character but I do not like her in the rights um and so my favorites typically are like Rookie. it's fast and quick I like the fast and quick ones although I will use yeah I know <laughs> <laughs> 
and quick are the same word. I don't know why I just said fast the and same quick. thing. Fast, fast and quick. Fast and quick. quick. <laughs> I think what I meant to say is small and quick, which, anyways. But um, <laughs> the, the characters that could move throughout the map very nimbly are my favorite characters. So I'm leveling Rook. I'm just ignoring all of you. I, I'm <laughs> Sorry, it was just the way that Alexa so aggressively put the pillow away. <laughs> I didn't like, see that. No, that's, no, <laughs> no, <laughs> not what you said. I'm sorry. I'm not to get together. I'm to get together. Um, I tend to only use Jody when I have to, and not, not not that you ever have to, but like I did. Um, Sandra. So like, there's a there's a character in the game where you would you can super level up your characters. They'll give you like a special token if you manage to get past. Um a trial right with just one character. So like Jody has her own different challenge. Uh, Rookie has their, they all have their own different ones. So they unlock eventually throughout the game. It's all not all at once. So doing Jody's, I was like, I don't know that I'm ever, I, I did it on the second try, but the first playthrough, I was like, Holy crap. I'm really bad with her. I just don't know why, but she's just really too slow for me. And that's not usually what I go for, but actually after doing that specialized, right. I used her more in, like, the coming ones because I kind of got a better feel for her. Um, that said, yeah, Faye, I ne I'm never going to use. I don't care about her. Uh, main I named mine Shay instead of Faye. Oh. oh, that's right. You name her. I forgot about that. Um, and I don't think I'll ever use the main dude again. I've already forgotten his name. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> He's Husbando material, though. He's hot. He's cute. The yeah. Unnamed Husbando. 10 out of 10 would bang. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I'm like, I'm going for, I'm going for the worm. I'm going for the imp and I'm going for rookie. Like those are tend to be the ones I go for. Although I'm now starting to add harpy lady into the mix. And I'm very sorry that I'm butchering all these names. Um, but then the other thing actually that you had mentioned, or I think a comment in our Patreon video or our YouTube somewhere, uh, had talked about how the language was crafted. It's not just like a random gibberish language. Mm -hmm. It's actually a real thing. I've started Correct. listening more to it. And I hear it now. And I'm actually more appreciative of it. So thanks, whoever commented that. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, and I, I would like to clarify. I apologize if I made it sound like the language in the game was just random gibberish. Um, kind of like... You I know, thought it was. Earl's gibberish lie. in Borderlands. It's not like that. Um, it is a, a very crafted language that they that the folks at uh, Supergiant Games have put a lot of time into. So, um, thank you for that clarification. And yeah, it's um, I'm intrigued to learn that it, that's cool that you're starting to like recognize specific parts of it. It just sounds more now that I I know to sort of listen, I can hear parts of it. I'm like, oh yeah, this is a language, isn't it? Because it isn't just like. Like I don't know, gobbledygook. <laughs> it's not gobbledygook. It's a real thing. There's there's a method to the madness. Yeah. Well, cool. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to playing more of that as well. So, um, we had lots of games to play. <clears throat> we have lots of games yet to play. We played a lot of games. Um, what are you ladies looking forward to to trying out uh, next week? Uncharted's coming out. Uncharted is coming. I Uncharted. A code for Yakuza Kimawari to dig into. I do love those Yakuza games. So, And Undertale is out. Undertale is out on PS4. Well, yeah. it's not new, but yes. No, no it's not. It's for, it, for a platform. I put a couple hours into it. Um, by next week, I should have it finished. So I can talk about Undertale then. Fantastic. Well, thanks for hanging with us and hearing all about our hands-on impressions. We are going to take another quick break, and we will have some more What's Good Games for you on the other side. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> the face that Steimer is making is so good. Oh, if, fuck. If, if you have never joined <laughs> us on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash what's good games to check out the video version of this show, 
I highly encourage you to do so. Today's is a today's is a good one to start with. If this is where you're going to start, yeah, you just want to show off your Animal Crossing shirt. We've had I do, but we've, much. we've had some pillow <laughs> antics. There have been some faces. And then when you have time, go back and watch the episode that Brittany animated. Oh yeah, that's a good. That one. was really good. My finest work. It's so good. Um. Okay. So this week on our third segment, we are taking another listener email listener email so we have said that if you guys would like to contact us you can email us at contact at what's good games.com that's our email you can reach out to us on twitter what's good underscore games you can leave us a message on facebook our facebook page facebook.com slash what's good games we got a good community building over there and speaking of facebook communities i want to give a shout out to all of the awesome admins of the what's good games fan page yes they are lovely people who are running the What's Good Games community fan page. And um, there's a really nice sense of camaraderie there. Some really fun posts. Um, and if you guys are ever interested in checking it out, um, you can do so on Facebook. So shout out to those folks. So this one comes from Matt. He says, good evening, What's Good Games panel. I have a question for you ladies that I would love to hear your response on. Simply put, what game that was in development and then canceled would you want to go back into development until it was finished and released? If you want to add depth to the question, how much would you pay to have the game finished and released? Mine would very clearly be Mega Man Legends 3. I'm a baller on a budget, so I think I would top out at 2.5 times the regular price to be able to have that game. So seeing as it would have been a 3DS game, I would pay around $100. Wait, you would pay one hundred dollars to fund the development of a video game? I think I've paid two hundred dollars to fund the development of a video game on Kickstarter. I think, I think what he's saying is that he yeah. would pay a hundred dollars as opposed to your usual price tag okay, for the so yeah. Game. What you would pay, pay for, for the, the game. game? Gotcha. Yeah. You what Kickstarter did you give two hundred dollars to? I th- I think there was two actually. I did one. One was um, wow. My brain's really done. <laughs> <laughs> the double fine one. What is wrong with me? Broken age. I gave broken age. Thank you. Oh there my you go. god. My brain just went. Doop. It happens. <laughs> it happens when you get older. Um, but I gave them two hundred bucks, and then I gave uh the hero U devs two hundred bucks, and then I never gave another Kickstarter any. No, that's not true. I got Pillars of Eternity, but I only paid enough to. Uh, get the game in that one, so it was like fifteen or twenty bucks. I have the incredible misfortune to have backed at a significant amount both Project Phoenix <laughs> and Unsung Story, both abject Kickstarter failures. Those JRPGs that were never made. Unsung Story actually, like the game was bought by Little Or, like the whole project was bought by Little Orbits, and they're going to finish it mm-hmm. almost four years after that Kickstarter went live. So I uh... have never backed anything on kickstarter ever again um as for the game the game that i would like to revive yes alexa ray i wrote a story i wrote a story about this um two three no yeah last year last year game spot do we need to grab a snack no i will make this one short um i like snacks to make to make it very very (laughs) short uh uh many 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 moons ago it, uh, a small studio in Sweden uh, called Grin went out of business and had like a a um, closing sale or closing auction or whatever. And it became known to the public that Grin was working on a Final Fantasy game funded by Square Enix. It was a Square Enix sanctioned Final Fantasy game. The first major installment to be made outside of Japan. Uh, Some of the mobile games have had involvement from outside studios, but this would be the first one made out of Japan. And it was a, a sequel. What would be the second sequel to final fantasy 12, my least favorite final fantasy. However, why do you want this game? You ask Alexa when you hated final fantasy 12 so much. Well, let me tell you (laughs) the game sounded awesome. Uh, The game was codenamed Fortress, and you played as a character that was kind of meant to be the original protagonist of Final Fantasy XII, and you see all of the characters in a new, somewhat unsavory light, and you spend most of the game in this giant fortress that kind of slowly gets destroyed around you. And it would be the fortress and then like surrounding lands where you would go and get your resources. And the whole premise was there's this ancient prophecy that every 10,000 years, this king comes out of the sea with his fish armies and attacks the land. 
And this fortress was built as like the last bastion um, or the first gate, I guess, the first bastion of keeping this king from coming on land. And people forgot it. And the legend like, oh, it's not real. It's a story. Well, lo and behold, not a story. Fish King's coming. So <laughs> the Final Fantasy 12 people go, oh, we got to go battle the Fish King now. And they travel to like the edge of the world and reside in this giant fortress and fight him. And every chapter you're fighting in a different area of the of the fortress and utilizing that landscape it's kind of tower defense but more like more akin to the fortress battles that i saw that you see in like shadow of war where you go in with your army and then have to fight your way through and then you have that last big boss battle and this sounded really cool there were boss battles where like krakens would fight up walls and you would like have to like do like a zelda style plant bombs to take people out um, the story was really dark and had like a really sad ending, which is not something you see a lot of Final Fantasy games have. Like it wasn't a poignant sad ending. It was just a sad, sad ending, no matter what you did. And it sounded really cool. And the story I wrote for GameSpot, I got in touch with uh, Ulf Anderson, who was one of the studio heads um, back at Grin. And he um, gave me, and they're published on GameSpot.com, published... Uh, the storyboards for the game along with the complete summary of it and it sounded really really cool and a lot of the gameplay stuff sounded cool so I would 100% loved would have loved to see this game come to fruition I'd love to see an outside studio do something with Final Fantasy um, as for what I would pay for the game if it came out like I would pay that like full full price plus plus $30 season pass whatever it is for it because it sounds so cool and I spent two and a half years researching this story and trying to get in touch with the people involved in it. So I have a very personal stake in it. Um, so yeah, that is what I would like to see come back is the canceled fortress from Grin. All right. Yeah. Well, I think the first thing that came to mind when I was thinking about um, canceled games was one I think one of you girls might be talking about. Um, so I'm going to pick something maybe a little bit more obscure. So um Bioware. Say the first one, though. What, what was that? Oh, are you going to say the first one? The one that you think... One Star Wars 1313. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So, I'm going to talk about Bioware's it. game that I got to see at PAX many, many moons ago. So, they were making this game called Shadow Realms. It was a 4B, 4v1 action RPG being developed by the Austin studio, which is now shuttered. So... This was first announced Austin during... still working on Star Wars? Bioware's? No, you... Bioware's Yeah. Team? Yeah. They're the, it's the Star Wars uh, MMO team. But they're but it's no longer open in Austin, is it? I didn't think they closed it. Did they? Hold on. Let me Google this. I thought, I thought they, they did. Thought huh? they did. Um, but please, correct mm. me. I could potentially be very wrong about this. So, um, this game... Um, I'm going to read a little description here. So set on modern day earth and a parallel world known as Embra would have players taking on the roles of magic wielding heroes caught in a war to save humanity against the evil shadow legions. So this got, um, got canceled because really, I think what the root of it was, was that the, the concept was just a little too abstract. So the way that it played was it was four player co-op and then there was like a like a an overlord, like the fifth person was like almost like the dungeon master, um, in in D and D, where they got to kind of change the the play pieces throughout the level. And the idea was that the four players would have to work together to get through the level and fight off the monsters while working against this dungeon master, essentially like pulling the strings behind the scenes, trying to make it impossible for them to finish, like putting obstacles like spikes on the floor or sending out different waves of monsters or essentially like throwing everything they could at them to prevent them from being able to complete their task or finish the level. And I thought that was a really kind of interesting idea. You know, this 4v1 multiplayer thing has been explored a couple of other times. I thought Evolve did a nice job with it. Um, the, the Turtle Rock Studios who, you know, from Left 4 Dead fame made that multiplayer game. Did you guys ever play that game? What? With the monsters, oh, yeah. with the hunters, Evolve. and then you had to sh one person I didn't, played the I monster. Did, I, yeah. I've seen it, but I, I didn't play I it. I actually really liked that game. Yeah, it was fun. But um, Fable Legends also, all of, and they also <laughs> they also canned that one. Fable yeah. Legends worked a similar way. Um, so I thought it was a really cool idea, and it was a game that I was excited about playing and thought that was going to be really neat, and 
then they canceled it. And I was like, why? Womp. I played a game very similar. That's why I'm looking at my phone. I'm trying to remember what it was. It was a few years ago, and it was just like that. It was D&D, but it was like the 4v1 Dungeon Master real-time combat. And I did a demo of it. Um, I'm trying to remember what that name was, but it was very similar to that. That's what it was. Was it so that? That's, no, this was, um, I think, Sword Coast Legends is the name of it. Oh. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I played this in 2015, so PAX West two years ago. But if you're interested, let me know, and I have some info for you, girl. I haven't seen... I've been looking. I see nothing about Bioware Austin closing. They definitely had layoffs and stuff, but as far as I'm aware, that's where the team, and according to the internet, still the MMO team is there. It's probably a much smaller team than what was once there. Okay. Uh, well, well, then. Um... um what I would pay for that game? I don't know, actually. I, the same, the normal amount? I guess I was never really, like, super invested in a game that got canceled. Yeah, that was my struggle with that part of this question, is part of me was like, I probably wouldn't pay anything other than... The normal what price? I would normal, yeah. than the normal price, because I, if it was canceled, it was probably canceled for a reason. Um... That being said, it doesn't mean that you're not sad about it, but you kind of have to trust that somebody knows what they're doing. You never got, like, turbo Hopefully. invested in a game, and then they were like, goodbye. Turbo Whatever. invested? I like no. Slightly I like invested? Sure. The versus 13 effect. Okay, so why I do mean, you like to call it that? Because Final yeah. Fantasy versus 13 <laughs> was in development forever, and people were like, no, it's coming eventually. I'm into it. And they're like, surprise, it's this other game and doesn't look anything like the original trailers. I think I would be, I would feel that way if Ubisoft had come on stage or done an interview at E3 this year and said, hey, I know we talked about bringing Beyond Good and Evil 2 back, but we just aren't going to anymore. Then I probably, that probably would have been the first one that I would have been like pretty crushed about. Yeah. But they didn't. Instead, they showed a cool thing, and they're like, we're working on it, guys. It's going to be another five years before it comes out. Hope you don't mind. Well, <laughs> people lost their minds. People cried. It was a good moment. Yes. Including the people on stage. Yes. Yeah. Uh, what do you pick, Slimer? So I have um, one quick one, because I, I don't really... It, it's probably for the best that it did get canceled. Um, but I thought... Uh, Dragon Scale? That was the name of it, right? I'm not making that up. The scale Bound? Scale, scale Bound. Shit! Bound. Why did I call it Dragon Scale? Anyways. There's a same thing. Dragon in it? Mm. Dragon in it. I, <laughs> I think that makes it like... Uh, anyways, I, I, I didn't like the protagonist. He was too dude bro -y, But I liked the idea of having like a co-op dragon game with friends. Like That sounded fun. Um, but it rest in peace. Uh, the game I actually care about, though, and was really quite sad when it was canceled was Titan. Um, Titan? Bl Blizzard's Titan. Because I really dig MMOs, and the fact of the matter is I kind of missed the boat on early WoW days, and I kind of wished I hadn't. Um, so I was really excited to get in on the ground level of a Blizzard MMO, and then so they just pulled the rug out from under me. What so was Titan supposed to be like? Amazing. The world... <laughs> Next best greatest MMO of all time. So I'd have to go I, pull up the oh. things on it because I don't. I didn't. I didn't copy paste any uh, anything out. But I just remember that. I remember feeling that gut punch for sure when they had the articles going out. The Titan was officially canceled. So um, I think the interview was with Polyon, but Blizzard did say that pieces of Titan were like Overwatch. Right. Has yeah. has has concept from titan in it yes it's just not the game so according so to the um to mr jason trier over at kotaku jason who spoke to people at ex blizzard employees who worked on it he says that it would have taken place on a near future version of earth in a science fiction depiction of the world where mankind has successfully fought off an alien invasion. Players would join one of three factions waging a cold war over control of the planet In zones planned for the game. It ranged from the West coast of the United States to Europe, South America and Australia. According to a source, Blizzard's plan was to make the game world huge and to keep adding areas with expansions in the years after launch, as you do with an MMO. So, 
That's like the basic concept. Yep. I just wanted another Blizzard MMO, but a new fresh Girl, one. a whole story about but this that thing. That sounds cool. Well, we're not going to read the whole thing unless Damn you want it. me to read the whole thing. If you want to know yeah, all know. about what Titan <laughs> was it. supposed to be, <laughs> there's an article on Kotaku called Here's What Blizzard's Titan Actually Was. Mm-hmm. That you can read Shire. all about. And then get sad because it's never going to happen. Well, Stop trying well. to make fetch happen. It's not going to happen. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Sad it. It's true. So when I was thinking about this, my first gut reaction was Earthbound 64. Because that went through a crazy development cycle over 12 years. It was starting... Development started in 1994 in the Super Nintendo. And then it went to the N64. And then it was going to do the N64 DD. And then went back to N64. It was briefly a concept for GameCube. And then in 2006, it was finally re-released for the Game Boy Advance. Uh, so I don't really know if I can count that as a game that never yes. released. But, sure uh, well, well, thank you, Samer. I don't have to talk about my next one. But I'm going to anyway. Um, the, the one thing that, it's not necessarily a game game. Um, Ze- the Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, U- Ura? Alexa, I butcher Ura. this every time. Ura. Ura. Uh, and so essentially that translates to another. Am I correct? Yeah, pretty much. Okay. And so this all went down in the mid-90s when I was like seven or eight years old. So how things actually transpired, I'm not totally sure because I wasn't paying attention at the time. Um, and now that I'm trying to like look at information, there's lots of convoluted theories and stories um, ranging from all sorts of different ideas. But basically what URA was, what the theory that makes the most sense to me is that Ocarina of Time was going to launch with the, disc, the N64 DD. And for some reason, they scaled it back to fit on the N64 cartridge. And in doing so, they had to scrap content. And so after I had, that had happened, um, Miyamoto had said that Ura was out there and that it had new dungeons, new areas, new quests, new characters, new lands, all of these rad new things to do. And then the N64 DD flopped, failed, and we never even got an official release here in the U.S., so everyone's like, hey, where's that content? Where are all these new temples and dungeons? And then Master Quest released for the GameCube, which was essentially they took Ocarina of Time and reworked some of the, te- the temples and dungeons so the layouts are different. And Miyamoto has said, that is your Ocar- Ocarina, Ocarina of Time. Ura. But everyone's like, no, it's not, because there's no new dungeons. There's no new temples. There is a unicorn temple that was teased supposedly at some point, and there are pictures of it. A unicorn um, temple? Yeah. I like, want a literally. unicorn temple. Yeah. And so I would give my ovaries and oh, an, and an wow. undisclosed amount of money if I could get this content. So how it was supposed to work is that you were supposed to be able to take – the cartridge, the N64 cartridge, and then put in the like magnetic drive, I think is what they were calling it, um, into the N64 DD, and then it would open up like new content for you. It was supposed to be essentially DLC. And I think a lot of that content got scrapped, and now it's floating out in the nether, and I don't think any of us will ever really get our hands on it. But I would pay a lot for that. I can't put a limit on it because I'm kind of crazy when it comes to these sorts of things, and I might spend a lot. So I don't know. You just said you would throw yourself into early menopause for this game. Yeah, I would. That's true. That is what you said. <laughs> I would, essentially. Christ. I would give up any children. Uh, that might be an overstatement. But I would give a lot to have that in my life. A lot, a lot. Okay, so I don't know if you can necessarily put a price on that. But no. Um, I did want to talk about Star Wars 1313. Ooh, so, yes. ooh, me. so this game... <laughs> is something that sounded super awesome to a lot of us out there. Yeah. Gritty take on the Star Wars universe follows the exploits of a young Boba Fett exploring an underground area of Boba Fett. Corsican known as Level 1313. But when Disney purchased Lucasfilm, it made the decision to change the Star Wars franchise position from an internal development to a licensing model for Star Wars video games. So... Fun story. At a bar with an undisclosed person. Okay. At an undisclosed gaming convention. Oh my god, did we have the same experience? I got to see some f- gameplay footage of Star Wars 1313. Yes. Mm-hmm. Go I on. can't say who showed it to me. Sure. But I can Not say asking. that I saw it 
And I freaked the fuck out when I saw it. I was like, how did somebody kill this game? Now, I don't know what kind of vertical slice I saw, what portion of the game it was. Many drinks had been had when this person showed this piece of footage to me that they clearly weren't supposed to show me. Um, <laughs> but this was many years ago now at this point. And um, it was it was interesting to me that um, something like this could be such a potential huge project and a company like Disney would squash it, you know, like, and, and I was, and I know that there's so many moving parts to it. Like, you know, there was something to do with, you know, EA acquiring the Star Wars license to make these video games and the deals that they had in place with the other studios that were making said video games. We now know that there's like four separate studios working on Star Wars stuff currently. Mm -hmm. And, and I don't know like how this game kind of fell through the cracks. I would like like a really nice backstory of somebody. <laughs> Maybe we can commission Danny O'Dwyer to to do a no clip Ooh, on what happened yeah. in Star Wars 2013. Yes. So it's not out yet, but our good friend Jason Schreier, previously mentioned in this segment. I wouldn't call him a good friend. For the record, your good friend, maybe. <laughs> so he, I don't know him at all. <laughs> he neither. has a book. He has a book coming out um, in, I think, next month about uh, called Blood, Sweat, and Pixels. And it's a bunch of stories about in-development games. I have a pre-release copy. I'm almost done with it. And the last chapter is on Star Wars 1313. Does he spill the goods? I haven't gotten there yet. Wait, you, <gasps> but you said you have the chapter. I do. It's sitting He's in my not house. not done with I'm it yet, though. It in order. I just finished the Uncharted 4 chapter. Oh. Interesting. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really good. But I'm excited to get to that one. And I... I'm glad they put it at the end of the book because it feels like the cherry on the Sunday. Yeah. For that particular game. I also heard for 1313, I've heard that I've heard of a lot of um uh element cannibalization within the Lucasfilm story group and the wider media properties working on it. And I don't know if any of you have watched Star Wars, uh the Clone Wars cartoons. No. And no. so in one of the later seasons. Um, Ahsoka, one of the main characters, actually ends up in that seedy, seedy underbelly of the bounty hunters, which is where 1313 would have taken place. Um, the like underbelly of Coruscant, I think it was. Mm -hmm. And yep. she goes down in 1313 as a reference to level 13. And her story takes place on levels, I think it's like she goes to level 14, like 15, 14, and like 12, not 13. And it's sort of a a unspoken spoken thing that like the concept for and these episodes came out long after thirteen thirteen was canceled, so it's sort of the the idea that like this same idea was taken and repurposed and used in another piece of Star Wars media, so it's sort of like it's like looking at it, but not. But the idea survived. The game just did not. Hmm. I feel like. With the with the guts being made of this game, why wouldn't you just let a studio pick it up and make it? You know, like because we're all waiting with bated breath for what Amy Hennig is doing with Star Wars, right? Like I yes. think we all can agree. Yes, like, yes, can't wait. This That's is the, the one. one. Like Battlefront, sure, that looks cool, bro. But like, what is but, Amy Hennig but, like, doing with Star Wars? Yeah, when did we get to see that game? And I think that you know, from what I've heard about the development of Thirteen Thirteen, and you know, what I saw with my own eyes, like I was like, this looks like it'd be real cool. Why didn't you make this game? Please don't tell me the bureaucracy, like the red tape of video game politics is what killed this game, which I think is sadly probably probably what ended up doing probably. It. probably. Um, that game I probably should have picked as my first bet now that I'm talking through it. It might have been That's okay. Now that I, I think about it and the direction that they've completely taken Star Wars after the purchase, like they've moved they've moved away from characters like i know like boba fett was like a fan fascination like mm -hmm. he became popular because fans became obsessed with him and i feel like maybe it was a conscious decision on their part to move away from him specifically and that kind of thinking and then focus on like new characters maybe possible yeah but i mean they still are clinging on to all the other old characters maybe because they're still they're now back in the new trilogy so not all of them star wars spoilers yeah well 
Whatever. Not all of them. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so, Robert. any others, ladies, that come to mind? I mean, we could talk about Silent Hills. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're like, man. That game did not exist. That was a pretty trailer. <laughs> That was a that was a fappy thing. That's a lot of things that happened though. <laughs> They're just pretty was trailers. It, was it artistic fapping? That was artistic was fapping. It, yeah. It was oh good. yeah. It was great. Yeah. It was cool, but it was. That's pretty much the definition of it. That game well, did not exist. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, I think I was really excited about Guillermo del Toro making a video game. Yeah. I spoke to. Guillermo del Toro on a red carpet at the Video Game Awards in like 2010 or something like that, 2011 maybe. Uh, I still have the 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 interview online somewhere where I asked him about this video game he was making with THQ back when they existed. Insane. Yeah. R.I.P. Uh, yeah, I remember so, that. So when he talked to when it came forward when he was going to be making Silent Hills with Kojima, I was like, this is going to be great. And then it got canceled. And I was like, when is Guillermo del Toro going to make a goddamn video game? Guillermo del Toro. He's not is- now because he was burned so bad. And he's just gruntled about video games. I so don't makes blame me- him. He I was, don't blame him. He was yeah. in the last um, Death Stranding trailer. Oh, That's was true. he? He was. He was the guy, the guy holding the baby, walking through the sewer. Ooh. Hiding from the, yeah, that was Guillermo del Toro. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Andrea, <laughs> will you play Death Stranding? If it's like, it turns out to be kind of horror-y, will you play it? I mean, I kind of have to, right? I know. It's a Kojima joint. You can't cover your eyes, though. I know. How about We're I sit next open. to you while you play it? Yeah, Perfect. I'll be there, too. Because I'm that. also scared. Just okay. feed me shots, and I'll be okay. good. Okay, good. All right, so um, that'll probably wrap it up for this week, unless there's some parting thoughts. Love you all. Thank you for the amazing community on the social medias. I see all of you, and you are greatly appreciated. Yeah, we love all of you guys. Don't to hesitate PAX. to reach out to us at all. Yes, and come to PAX if you are going to be in the Seattle area. We'll have, um, we're, I know I've mentioned that we're having a, a meetup. The details are getting TBD. finalized as we speak. <laughs> and um, when we do the show next week, we'll have the final details for you, I hope. Fingers Sweet. crossed. But um, yeah, a big thank you to all of our fans over on Patreon who support us every month. We wouldn't be here without you guys. That's patreon.com slash what's good games. We recently did um, some feedback interaction with you guys. Know that we are processing it all. We're compiling it all. We're going to... Um, go over it. There's some really great ideas, some really constructive stuff. So thank you so much for, you know, having a dialogue with us about our content. You know, we're we're new. We're still figuring out what this show is going to be long term. And, you know, we want you guys to be part of that conversation. We want this to be a a nice symbiotic relationship. So, um, yeah, we're going to be we're going to be working on some stuff. So thank you for hanging with us while we work out the kinks and make this the best show on the internet. (laughs) All right. So that's going to be it for us for this week. Everybody have a fantastic weekend and um, we'll see you next time. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.